Welkom bij Dutch TV, welkom at Dutch TV. Vandaag gaan we het hebben over fietsen in Australië. Is dat nou wel zo veilig en die vervelende helm kunnen we daar niet een keertje vanaf? De uitzending zal in het Engels zijn, omdat nieuw, niet al onze gasten Nederlands spreken. En bij mij te gast zijn Emmy Heikamp en Peter Burke. Welkom. Peter, you're the general manager of the Cycling Promotion Fund. And Emmy, you've started the company Dutch Cargo Bike. What has inspired you to dedicate your life to cycling? Well, it's certainly from my perspective, I've got a, my personally, I've got a sports science background. I've got a health and fitness background. I also have a, uh, a community development background. And they have all, I guess, come together in a, well, the bicycle is a perfect vehicle for all of those outcomes, whether it's health, whether it's fitness, whether it's social change, whether it's transport, whether it's in impact on the environment in all the areas I've worked previously, the bike is the perfect vehicle for all those outcomes. Sounds good. And about the Dutch cargo bike company, how, how did you come up with the idea? How did it all start? We had twins and being Dutch, I wanted to cycle. So we started with a trailer behind the bike and I didn't feel comfortable with that. Um, mainly because I didn't trust everyone else on the roads and I couldn't manage the kids when away in the back. And one has poking the eye out of the other. And so I was looking for a decent cargo bike and I couldn't find one. So we started importing five bikes, selling four and keeping one for ourselves. That's really, really small. And then slowly got our first container of bikes in and now we've expanded. We've got like six, seven brands of different cargo bikes. Are you the first cargo bike importer in Australia? No, we're not. No? No, 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 no people. Okay, but yeah. for most people it's, it's still a relatively new Yes, it's thing? a new concept. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They still get questions like, oh, did you make it yourself? No, no, we didn't. No, <laughs> no. All right. Um, we're going to talk more about safety in a bit, but mm -hmm. first I would like to show you a little video clip that we made um, when, we were, when Dutch TV was traveling in the Netherlands. Um, and it's about the Dutch cycling embassy in Utrecht. Please take a look. Yeah. Can you tell me what is that? Where do you work? I work for the Dutch cycling embassy. Um, yeah. En dat is een, een stichting die is opge, opgericht om het fietsen internationaal te promoten. En dat doen we eigenlijk voor de hele BV in Nederland. Dus voor publieke organisaties zoals de overheid, gemeenten, provincies. Maar ook voor private organisaties, dus uh, commerciële organisaties, uh, adviesbureaus, ingenieursbureaus. Maar ook kennisinstellingen zoals universiteiten, uh, hogescholen en maatschappelijke organisaties zoals een fietsersbond. En waarom uh, heb, jij, uh, heb jij nu al contact met Australië? Uh, ja, op dit moment hebben we uh, vrij veel contact met Australië. Nee. Uh, dat is uh, vorig jaar ontstaan. Vorig jaar is er een, een delegatie uit Australië naar Nederland gekomen, ook hier in Utrecht. Uh, en we zijn gaan maar, kijken uh, naar de fietscultuur in Nederland. Hoe doen we dat? Uh, hoe gebruiken wij de fiets? En uh, vervolgens zijn wij uh, naar Australië zelf geweest, hebben we daar ook met mensen gesproken. En daar is nu uit voortgekomen dat er uh, twee Nederlandse fietsexperts zijn gevraagd voor uh, de Cycling Promotion Fund in Australië. Om uh, Australische uh, ambtenaren, zullen we zeggen, van uh, de steden, ik moet het goed zeggen, uh, Perth, Melbourne, we willen ook naar Sydney en Adelaide. Uh, om ze te helpen met fietsplannen te bekijken en te verbeteren om uh, het fietsen ja, in die steden uh, uh, veilig en aangewend te maken. Wat we adviseren is, uh, leg niet alleen fietspaden aan, maar zorg ook dat die paden uh, veilig zijn. Pas de set verkeersregels aan, geeft de fietser ook echt een onderdeel in, het, uh, in de wetgeving. Ja, een voorbeeld, hier in Nederland ben je als fietser uh, beschermd, uh, uh, je hebt vaak uh, voorrang. Als er een ongeluk is, is het meestal de auto die schuld is. Um, naast de verkeersregels is ook opleiding heel belangrijk. Kinderen leren op school, krijgen ze fietsverkeersles, ze moeten een diploma halen. Dus ze leren zich te handhaven in het verkeer, krijgen gelijk die regels mee. Maar ook ouderen worden uh, uh, 
gestimuleerd om op de fiets te gaan. Er komen speciale aangepaste fietsen met een lage instap of met uh, twee wielers. Hè. Daar begin je mee, eindig je ook mee. Ja. Um, dat. Um, en uh, uh, de overheid stimuleert bedrijven ook om uh, uh, ja, uh, die mobiliteitsconcepten te, hand, te, te hanteren. He, dus het uh, stimuleren van het openbaar vervoer, uh, de fiets uh, te gebruiken voor het woon-werkverkeer. Zo'n hele set aan maatregelen ja, maakt dus dat je samenleving het, uh, het makkelijker wordt uh, om te gaan fietsen. Ja. Wat vind je nou van het idee van een helm dragen in Nederland? Ja. Uh, ja, hier in Nederland hoeft dat eigenlijk niet. Tenzij je op een uh, racefiets zit en uh, hoge snelheden maakt waardoor de kans op vallen aanzienlijk is, dan zeg ik ja, dat is verstandig. Maar als jij gewoon uh, dagelijks fietst, dan zeg ik hoef je geen helm te dragen. Waarom uh, uh, hier wel, hier niet en in Australië wel? Het kan zijn dat het, uh, hè, als ze de sportfiets gebruiken, blijft daar ook hetzelfde argument, dan is de kans op vallen uh, uh, aanwezig. Als er mensen zijn die net zijn gaan fietsen en dus onzeker zijn en met een helm zich zekerder voelen, dan zeg ik gebruik de helm alsjeblieft. Uh, maar in principe zou je ervoor moeten zorgen dat uh, fietsers uh, veilig uh, kunnen fietsen en dan is een helm eigenlijk niet nodig. All right, nice. I really would like to discuss safety a bit more with you. If I speak for myself, I still feel quite unsafe in Melbourneian traffic. I do cycle a lot, but I'm yeah, quite scared at times as well. Sometimes you use the pedestrian area because it feels safer. Um, and I wanted to ask you, what do you think about safety here in Australia when it comes to cycling? We cycle, most of our clients cycle with children. And the Victorian law says if you guide a uh, child under 12, you're allowed on the footpath. So I would use that when it's very busy traffic. Otherwise, we cycle mostly suburban, so not that much in CBD. And that's perfectly fine. You can cycle there. You, can, you have to choose the smaller roads, so not the main roads. But as long as you do that, I think it's pretty safe. And would you say it's a little bit more scary with a cargo bike? No, you're bigger. <laughs> you have a bumper. <laughs> you have a bumper, you're bigger. So people are a bit like, what's that? Yeah. And they just go a bit wider, aren't you? Yeah. So yeah. Especially yeah. when there are kids inside, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And what would you say? Certainly from our perspective, there's, there's places that are much safer than others, and we want to make it safer. Um, we've certainly undertaken a fair bit of research, and we know that in Australia, up to 60% of the population said they would ride, if, but they didn't feel safe because of the traffic, because of the speed of volume, because of the interactions. So we know there's ways we can improve it. Um, as Emmy says, in, the, in certainly quite suburban areas, in uh, off-road paths, there's certainly some really safe places. But one thing we also notice is that um, we need to improve our safety. We need, to, we need to do that to get more women and children riding. Right now, if you have a look around, we know that give or take 80% of all bike riders are men. Um, if we have a look at the Netherlands, it's a, just about a 50-50 split. We know that to make it safer, that's what we have to do to make it more attractive for mothers that will allow their children. I mean, Emmy loves cycling, so she pushes it or encourages her children. Mm. But there's a lot of mothers out there that as they don't feel safe, they're not willing to let their children, which is one thing we really need to work on yeah. to improve the future. Are you both happy with your children cycling on their own? My children are four and five, yeah. so they're not cycling by themselves no. yet. They wish they could, but and if they cycle, it's on a footpath. And my daughter's six months old, so she's not r not <laughs> quite not out ready. there. No, <laughs> no well, she will, but not yeah. just yet. Do you think by the time she's ten, um, safety has increased so much that you're happy to let her go? It will depend on where we're living. That's a very open, uh, honest answer. There are certainly certain areas. Um, currently, where I live, I can ride on a shared path, separated from the road from my house to the CBD. Not a problem. But if there was ro uh, road interactions, certain road interactions, it, it, it would be an on-case evaluation or yeah. scenario. Yeah. Amy, what I would like to hear from you is when you just arrived in Australia, what was your first impression about cycling here? I find a lot of road bikes. And um, I find that people can't really cycle. They can't. 
I can I can use pedals, but I can't look at traffic at the same time and be part of of the rest of traffic. You're not in an indoor kind of area. You're outdoor and you're part of the rest of the road. So that's something I found astonishing. Yeah, people can't cycle. And when you stepped on the bike the first time, how how was it? Well, in suburbia, it's all right. It's um, if you're not on the highway. You're not on the highway. You not. I can imagine in the CBD, where you got taxis and trams and buses and a lot of going on. It's harder, but um, if you're out, it's all right. Yeah. I would like to um, compare the situation in the Netherlands with the situation in Australia with you. You're from uh, the Netherlands and you've been to the Netherlands. Yes. Can you tell me a bit about your the trip you've made last trip? It was a phenomenal trip for us. The outcomes have been huge. Uh, one of the states has already had uh, a record increase in infrastructure spend. They're already looking at speed limits. They're having a look at the way they design city planning in that particular state. To the extent that we're going back in September and we're taking people from public transport, we're people taking people from accident insurance, we're taking people from road design, we're taking automobile clubs. We realise that this is the inspiration is what they need. Yeah. The excitement is what they need. The realisation that it's possible is what they need. I mean, if you think about cycling back home in the past, what do you think we can learn here from the Netherlands? Well, the main thing I think is the attitude people sharing a path and not thinking about that's a car and that's a bicycle, but that's, it's someone in a car and it's someone on a bike. And I think in both ways, I think cyclists are quite negative about car drivers, but car drivers negative about cyclists. In the Netherlands, everyone is a cyclist and a car driver and yep. they don't make a difference in that. It's not a different religion over no, there. No, and it's, it's quite hard here. And I think that's a difference. Yeah. And you get educated differently. Yep. If you don't watch your mirrors when you get your driver license, you don't get your driver li license. If you just can open the door. If you just open a door, yeah. mm -hmm. you just don't get your driver license. Yeah. And it's also for, for children from young age that are on the bike and like my five year old, he knows the rules, he knows the traffic signs and he will stop when there is a stop sign or when there's a triangle shape, he knows when to stop. And so it's educating from a young age uh, that will help creating um, a better shared path, shared roads um, ability. Yeah, yeah. Um, Peter, if we look at the situation in Melbourne, is it how does it compare to the rest of Australia? Would you think, would you say we're relatively well on track here? Melbourne is certainly leading in terms of uh, bike riding, um, with its with the grid pattern, the layout, the uh, and also the it is in terms of compared to Australia, it's relatively flat. It's obviously not as flat as the Netherlands. I, I understand. Um, it is in the front, but other cities, Perth, Brisbane, they are making huge investments and if Melbourne doesn't continue to invest, it will fall behind. Um, so it is good, but it always can get much better. Yeah. I'd like to discuss with you the future of cycling and what the future of cycling here in Australia should look like. What do you think, Emmy? I think the behaviour change that we just discussed, I think that's a huge uh, start starting points like education and pe how people think about each other on the road but it's also a shared path for cyclists and pedestrians they can't share a path either so th I think that would be helpful mm -hmm. um, it would help if the law would change in a way that the cyclists and a car get into a bit of a mess that the car drivers fault mm -hmm. yeah I think that would help but I understand that's a long process yeah mm -hmm. mm -hmm. what do you think Peter more rules uh, no, uh, I hate to say it quite so simply, just to touch on Emmy's point about, uh, well, presumed liability, which is what you're talking about. Um, we, the concept we 100% support and it would make a huge different difference. There are a few, obviously, the way our laws are set up, it's problematic to impl implement, but we certainly agree with that. That would have a huge change on attitudes. Um, rules, we are, there is so many rules in Australia right now and that's one thing we noticed when we went to the Netherlands and it was, uh, there was a small example where they said um, people were missing a roundabout or a pedestrian crossing before a roundabout because there was too many signs. So they removed the signs. In Australia, we would put up more. And it's really about the uh, driver taking responsibility for their own actions, whereas rules take that responsibility away. So um, it's a combination of factors. I agree. Uh, behaviour change, we definitely need to educate drivers, we definitely need to educate bike riders. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of missing infrastructure links, so 
for, uh, for me, out of those three, rules is the least important and behaviour change and infrastructure together because without the right infrastructure, uh, the behaviour change won't do it enough, but without the, be uh, without the behaviour change, the infrastructure is wasted. Yeah. Yep. So. Yeah, I agree on that. Can you tell me quickly something about the um, numbers of accidents, for example, in Melbourne when it comes to the cycling? Um, well, we know, unfortunately, we know there's uh, up to 45 to 50 uh, road deaths a year across Australia uh, for bike accidents. Um, we know that this is about 3% of the um, uh, death rate. I think that's the right figure. But we also know we're very overrepresented in accident rates. We're about 15%. Um, I'm giving you a national number, I'm not actually giving you a Melbourne or a Victorian number, but uh, we're relatively reflective. So we represent a very small portion of the deaths, but we, pr uh, we represent, we're well over represented in um, the accidents yep. and the serious injuries. And that is something that is, uh, for us, it's a high priority. When one of the challenges is we always talk about the road toll. Uh, when we talk about the road toll, unfortunately, we, we talk about deaths, which is really something horrible, but we don't talk about the serious injuries. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we really need to improve to, um, to, to go forward. Now, Melbourne is reflective across the rest of Australia. It's not uh, any different, but that is a national issue. Yeah. So we're n we don't have the like, safest environment yet. No. Uh, so I would like to ask you, what kind of tips can we give to cyclists or for Dutch people who just arrived in Australia to be safe on the roads? For Dutch people just arriving, cycle on the left side. <laughs> 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 yes. That's, um, Good idea. Yeah. Just be aware that um, people driving cars are not as aware of cyclists. So in the Netherlands you can do quite a bit because cars will see you anyway, but here they won't. Just because they n don't want to, but just because they it's not in, in, in their the system. No, it's not in the system. No. Mm. Any tips from you, Brie? Well, similar, drive on the left, right on the left, but also the brakes are on the opposite side. Uh, remember that as well, so you don't go over the handlebars. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but exactly what Emmy said, um, we often make comments about it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong, they're bigger. And unfortunately, cars in Australia are bigger. And because there's far less, of it, far less riders on the road, they are less aware of bike riders. So um, ride defensively. Um, we know that, I know ourselves, when we were in the Netherlands, we made some horrible mistakes because we looked the wrong way, but car drivers forgave us. In Australia, we don't quite have that forgiving um, uh, mentality on the road. Be aware that, uh, yeah, always be on the lookout, always be aware, and yeah, take responsibility, uh, and don't expect others to be quite as uh, aware of you as you may have been at home. Yeah. One question about something you just said. You said the brakes are on a different side? You mean left and right is? Yes. I've never noticed that. I must admit. <laughs> yes. Is it really true? Absolutely. On the, uh, I use them always at the same time, so it doesn't yeah. make a difference. It, exactly. We, we go backwards from Europe because we ride on the other side of the road. Um, it's about signaling with hands. Um, so, you, you know, when you put it, and uh, being in the centre of the road, which hand can you take off the handlebar? And that's what it's all about. Ah. So, yes. Yeah, so, so you need your right hand or your left hand to be the yeah, safe one. Yeah, absolutely. And so you, you don't want to see it, but it's not as uncommon for people when they come over, when they get on the other side of the road to go on the over the handlebars. Um, and if we are talking sports cycling, that's something that the uh, high-end sports athletes have to be very aware of because they're obviously going faster and using the brakes harder. That's something they very much have to be aware of, especially if it's an Australian going to a European team. It's one of the mistakes they have to be aware of. Very interesting. Thanks uh, <laughs> for teaching me this. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for coming here and sharing your story with us. We zijn alweer aan het einde gekomen van uh, onze uitzending van Dutch TV. We zijn erg benieuwd naar uw verhaal uh, en uw ervaring op de fiets. Voor de kijkers thuis, wij zijn erg benieuwd naar uw fietservaring. Dus ga naar onze Facebookpagina en laat uw uh, verhaal achter. En nu schakelen we over naar een heel ander onderwerp. Dit is een TEDx filmpje, geregeld door de Erasmus Foundation waardoor we nieuwe ideeën kunnen zien vanuit het Binnenhof in Nederland. Model Nature has a solution for every problem. Imagine walking in a pine tree forest after a thunderstorm. Looking at the glistening trees and inhale and smell the pine. I bet you can almost smell the pine here at the Riddelzaal. <laughs> But do you know where it, where it came from? The high electrical charge between the tree and the lightning 
put stress on the needles of the pine tree. Because of this stress, the needles flow, uh, uh, spray a substance. Um, this, the, the, the spraying of the substance has caused the nice smell. I bet a lot of you didn't know that it took us several years of research and development to know the exact mechanism of spraying of plants. And we are able now to spray plants in a controlled way. We call it milking of plants. With milking of plants, we are able to get nutrients out of a plant on a non-destructive way. The plant recovers and we can do it again and again without any harm to the plant. I can take out nutrients without destroying a plant. Think of Texol. Texol, for example, is used as a chemical for chemotherapy. If we want to treat one person with Texol, we need to cut down four to six adult Texas trees. If we want to treat all variant cancer in the US, that would require to cut down 360,000 trees. That's, of course, not acceptable. We want to keep this tree. Texol is now made on a, <coughs> excuse me, Texol is now made on a synthetic way in a chemical factory. Um, it's a very complex process and it uses a lot of energy and chemicals. What if we could replace this by a plant? See a plant as a chemical production unit. Green and environmentally smart. If we compare the, the extracting Texol with milking, we would learn something. To get Texol out of a plant on the traditional way, would, should, we should wait 50 years to mature the plant and then cut out the Texol. Cut it down and take, a, take out the Texol. If we milk the plant, we can start milking after a year and milk it every four to five weeks. If the plant grows, it produces liquid more and more. Um, we are now working with Flora Fluids on this plant called the Saturaya, better known as Bonekruid. Flora Fluids is taking out a chemical called Carvacrol. Carvacrol is used to prevent bacterial growth. Because it's low toxic level, it's nice smell and taste, it suggests it could be used as a food additive. Carvacrol is now used to feed cows. If we, we know that if we feed cows with it, we reduce the need for antibiotics with 35% in a cow because it reduces the bacterial growth. In the past, we cut the saturaya into pieces and heat the plant up with water. Because of the heat, we could easily collect the cover crawl. If we do it with milking, we save the plant and it recovers in a few weeks. Flora Fluids is using this technology to take out medicines and nutrients without, of, on a non-destructive way. But why? It's cheap, it's an easy process, it's recurring. It's recurring don't by nature a plan to refill daily. Isn't Mother Nature great? If we think about all the plants that there are and the nutritions that can help us live healthier lives, there's a, there's a world to explore. If we think about the rainforest with all the plants and nutrients that there or are, there is a world to explore again. But we are destroying the rainforest so fast that many of these plants will be lost forever. We have to choose between agriculture, of cultivating the land for agriculture, 
or save these plants for nature generations. I say, save the rainforest and start with teaching local farmers how to milk. If we use nature and start milking plants and don't destruct them, we are able to save the rainforest, learn the local farmer to milk, and save val valuable nutrients. Because these nutrients have impact on our lives. I say, modern nature has a solution for everything. Stop with destroying it and start with milking. Dan rest mij niets dan u een hele fijne week te wensen. Fiets voorzichtig en tot de volgende keer.